separate and apart from the case that has drawn the nation's attention, it's time to question laws that senselessly expand the concept of self-defense and so dangerous conflict in our neighborhoods. These laws try to fix something that was never broken. There has always been a legal defense for using deadly force if, and the if is important, if no safe retreat is available. But we must examine laws that take this further by eliminating the common sense and age-old requirement that people who feel threatened have a duty to retreat outside their home if they can do so safely by allowing and perhaps encouraging violent situations to escalate in public, such laws undermine public safety. The list of resulting tragedies is long and unfortunately has victimized too many who are innocent. It is our collective obligation. We must stand our ground to ensure must stand our ground to ensure that our laws reduce violence and take a hard look at laws that contribute to more violence than they prevent. I think it's clear <clears throat> that George Zimmerman not only killed an innocent man, but that Trayvon Martin would be alive today if he had been born white. Uh, if Trayvon had been white, it is beyond any reasonable doubt that he would not have been stalked by Zimmerman and he would not have found himself in a fight with George Zimmerman. There would have been no fight, no trial, no verdict, no dead boy. And as we reflect on what this moment means um, for our democracy and our racial present, I think it's critically important that we not allow ourselves to get bogged down in the details of who said what when, um, but rather step back and consider what this Zimmerman mindset, a mindset that views a boy walking in his neighborhood carrying nothing but Skittles and iced tea as a threat, this mindset that views black men and boys as a perpetual problem to be dealt with. This mindset has infected our criminal justice system, has infected our schools, uh, has infected our politics in ways that have had disastrous consequences, birthing a prison system unprecedented in world history, and stripping millions of basic civil human millions of people of basic civil and human rights once they've been branded criminals and felons it's this mindset that some of us defined largely by race and class um, are unworthy of our basic care and concern and can be dealt with harshly, written off uh, with impunity um, that has led to the birth of the prison industrial complex and I think a great deal of indifference uh, to the plight of those who are locked up in cages and prisons but also locked out um, of jobs and opportunity and find themselves trapped in ghettoized communities. Uh, Michelle Alexander, you've also suggested that if Zimmerman were actually a police officer, we would not be having this conversation. Could you explain what you mean by that and what the implications of it are? Absolutely. You know, uh, there has been an outpouring of anger and concern because of the actions of George Zimmerman, a private citizen who profiled uh, a young boy and pursued him and tried to confront him, perhaps. Um, but what George Zimmerman did is no different than what police officers do every day as a matter of standard operating procedure. Um, we have tolerated 
this kind of police profiling uh, and the stopping and frisking of young black and brown men. Um, we have tolerated this kind of conduct for years and years, um, recognizing um, that it violates basic civil rights, but allowing it to go on. Um, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, it is a crime for a private person to go up to another private person uh, armed with, you know, a loaded weapon and confront them, stalk them, uh, perhaps search all over their body uh, to see what they may have on them. Um, that is a crime. It's an assault with a deadly weapon, uh, aggravated battery or aggravated assault. But when a police officer does precisely the same thing, it's called stop and frisk. And, you know, as we know, stop and frisk policies uh, are routine nationwide. In New York City alone, more than 600,000 people are stopped and frisked every year, overwhelmingly um, black and brown men. Uh, and um, nearly all uh, are found to be innocent uh, of any crime or infraction and are harassed simply because they seem out of place, seem like they're up to no good. The same kinds of stereotypes and hunches that George Zimmerman uh, used when deciding that, you know, Trayvon Martin seemed like a threat in his neighborhood, you know, law enforcement officers employ all the time. Um, I believe that Trayvon Martin's life might well have been spared if many of us uh, who care about racial justice had raised our voices much, much sooner and much, much more loudly about the routine stereotyping and profiling of young black men and boys. Um, it is because we have tolerated these practices for so long um, that George Zimmerman uh, felt emboldened, I believe, to act on a discriminatory mindset that night. I wanted to ask you about this case of uh, uh, Marissa Alexander. Um, she's the 31-year-old African-American mother of three who was sentenced to 20 years in prison for firing what she maintains was a warning shot at her abusive husband. She has insisted she was defending herself when she fired the gun into a wall near her husband. Alexander had turned down a plea bargain that would have seen her jailed for something like three years. She attempted to use Florida Stand Your Ground law in her defense. Offense, but in March 2012, the jury convicted her after only 12 minutes of deliberation, and she was sentenced to 20 years behind bars under a Florida law known as 20, uh, 1020 Life that carries a mandatory minimum for certain gun crimes, regardless of the circumstance. This was an Angela Corey prosecution, uh, the, uh, the special prosecutor in the Trayvon Martin case, who ultimately brought the charge of second-degree murder against George, Ale uh, against George Zimmerman. Michelle Alexander, can you talk about this Florida law and the issue of mandatory minimums in general. Absolutely. You know, the case you just described is, you know, a stark example um, of, you know, the discriminatory application of the Stand Your Ground law itself. You know, here is a woman firing shots in the air to protect herself from what she believes is an abusive spouse, and she winds up getting 20 years while George Zimmerman, um, you know, is, is released scot-free after pursuing someone. Um, um, you know, based on racial stereotypes and assumptions of, of criminality. Um, she received a 20-year sentence because of harsh mandatory minimum sentences, sentences that exist in Florida and in states nationwide. Um, mandatory minimum sentences give no discretion to judges um, about the amount of time um, that the person should receive once a guilty verdict is rendered. Um, harsh mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses were passed by Congress uh, in the 1980s as part of the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement, um, sentences that um, have helped to fuel our nation's prison boom um, and have also greatly aggravated racial disparities, particularly in the application of mandatory minimum sentences for crack, um, cocaine. Um, it is the Zimmerman mindset, the mindset that some people 
um, viewed largely by race and class um, are a problem that must be dealt with harshly and just locked up and you know, the key thrown away that has helped to, uh, you know, drive the adoption of many of these mandatory minimum sentence laws. And uh, if we are serious about ending the Zimmerman mindset, uh, we must be committed to much more than ending vigilante justice. We must be committed to repealing all of the mandatory minimum sentence laws that reflect that kind of Zimmerman mindset, the mentality that some people can simply be disposed of um, are a problem, not people who have problems, but who are the embodiment of problem that can be uh, treated like mere throwaways. And I just wanted to correct, uh, her name is Marissa Alexander, um, the woman who is who was sentenced to 20 years in jail for shooting a gun. Uh, Nermeen? Uh, Michelle Alexander, you heard the comments of Attorney General Eric Holder. What do you think the Justice Department should be doing in response to this and in response to some of the trends that you've spoken of uh, in the criminal justice system. Well, with respect to the George Zimmerman case, I think they are right to continue their investigation into whether uh, federal civil uh, rights charges can be brought against George Zimmerman. I think it's highly unlikely that the Justice Department will actually file suit against George Zimmerman. Um, but I'm encouraged that they're actually uh, continuing the investigation. But simply investigating this one case <laughs> um, does not even begin to scratch the surface of what must be done. Um, although Attorney General Eric Holder does not have the authority to repeal mandatory minimum sentences and undo the legislation that has uh, you know, help to um, create the prison industrial complex, what he can do is insist that we have a national debate and dialogue. Uh, he can say that the passage of these mandatory minimum sentences was wrong um, and that it was done with a discriminatory mindset, that it was done with an attitude of overwhelming punitiveness um, towards poor people in general and poor people of color in particular, that it has had disastrous consequences for poor communities of color, and that we must undo the harm that has been done and repeal these laws so that uh, um, a more restorative and rehabilitative approach um, to criminal justice might be possible. He can do this. Um, you know, he, he, this is a conversation that I think he is well positioned um, to lead and to begin. But as we've seen with, you know, President Obama's administration, um, although, you know, both the president and Attorney General Holder often say they want to encourage frank dialogues about race, um, we've seen relatively little uh, in terms of, you know, actual initiative and leadership shown um, around issues of racial justice and um, I would hope that you know in the months that follow the Trayvon Martin tragedy that we will see much more courage and bold leadership coming from the Justice Department. Michelle.